get started reasonably on time. So um, Leon or Monica, which of you is going to be introducing our guest today? Leon, Thank you. all right, we're all yours. Everyone, if you would give your attention to Leon and I will give a shout out and a thank you because Leon and Monica suggested um, today's speaker and we're so pleased to have her and we've got some other suggestions we're following up on later in this summer. So if you have ideas from people from outside the congregation whose uh, interests and passions and expertise you think would be interesting to this audience, please do pass them on to me or to Sari uh, and we will be thrilled to follow up. So Leon, take it away. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take uh, just a few moments and uh, make sure that we have enough time for uh, the presentation and the follow-up uh, questions, but I hope there will be some. Um, someone just before the meeting started asked where uh, Colleen uh, was born. I'll just repeat it here. Um, she grew up in uh, New Orleans. She studied physics at uh, Rice uh, University. She got her BA in 1976. Um, she earned a PhD in nuclear physics from Duke University in 1983. And after an initial stint in teaching, she worked in the industry. Uh, one of the companies she worked for is a well-known company, uh, Rockwell International. Uh, afterwards, uh, she uh, formed her own uh, company, which was called uh, Rice Systems. Uh, she started out in her own garage. Um, she specialized in uh, optic uh, research in optics and worked for NASA. Um, I know that in 2005, uh, NASA dropped the Jupiter project, so they had to, or Colleen had to close her uh, company, but. Uh, uh, she got on with other things. Uh, she wrote uh, several books. Some of them uh, I'll just mention here. Uh, there's one called uh, Forensic Genealogy. Uh, another one was DNA and Genealogy and others. Um, and in, uh, finally, in, in mid-2000s, uh, she and her late partner began um, looking at uh, Forensic Genealogy. In 2012, uh, they founded uh, Identifinders International. This company uh, assisted in tracking down uh, biological families. Uh, they made uh, uh, military identifications, uh, tried to um, help solve cold uh, murder cases. And in 2017, uh, she co-founded a nonprofit organization called DNA Dope Project to identify um, unknown dead people. Some of her better known accomplishments, and this is just to mention a few, um, involved uh, identifying the body of a child died in 1912, Titanic uh, disaster, um, tracking down and obtaining a DNA from a relative of Amelia Earhart uh, Navigator, um, exposing international literary frauds, um, also, uh, which is the topic of today's uh, talk, uh, she was involved with helping Holocaust survivors find their families. Um, just recently in a competition that was called the uh, DNA Hit of the Year, uh, Colleen and her team uh, placed fifth out of 50 entries. And this was from uh, 20 countries. Um, in 2018, she placed fifth again out of 61 cases from 14 countries, uh, solving the Phoenix Canal uh, murder, which were uh, murders that occurred in Phoenix in uh, 19, Phoenix in 1992 and 93. Uh, just to uh, sum up here, because uh, I am taking too much time, I think, <laughs> uh, on my many discussions and talks with Colleen, she mentioned once that in, and that's a quote, in both nuclear physics and genealogy, you have to extract the signal from the noise. And um, as an engineer, uh, these type of terms are quite familiar to me. And there is a signal to noise ratio uh, that basically is used in science and in engineering to compare the levels of the desired signal to the background noise. Um, separating the noise from the signal to get a better picture of what is relevant 
is one of the most important aspects of the genealogical research. So um, let's hear how it is done. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend, Pauline Fitzpatrick. Pauline? I think you're muted. You have to unmute hey. yourself. Can I, can you all hear me? Yes. Can, you can. Now okay, I'll, I'll speak up. I tend to speak kind of quiet sometimes. Yeah, well, thank you uh, guys for having me. I appreciate it. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things, the work I've done reuniting Holocaust survivors with their families. Um, it's something I really have a passion for, so I love sharing the story. I met uh, Leon and Monica because that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm helping them with their genealogy and find their family. And also Ben and Lindy are here too. Uh, they're part of the same family. So that's how we kind of got acquainted. <clears throat> I'm very happy they recommended me for the seminar. Um, so let me share my screen. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, there we go. I think this is going to work. Can you all see my screen with my slides? Okay. So that being said, to just summarize, I, I can't, oh, how do I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to advance my slide. I'm having so, oh, there it is. Um, I, you know, my, actually my background is physics. And so just one slide on what happened. You know, I had always been interested in genealogy. I mean, I was born that way. I came from New Orleans and I knew all four grandparents and their brothers and sisters, and sometimes their aunts and uncles. So I grew up around living history. So I never became interested in genealogy. I was always part of genealogy, it was part of me. So that being said, going forward in the, in the two, about 2005, I mean, and I did a lot of DNA on my family, but about 2008, actually, I was contacted by the Armed Forces DNA Lab to help them identify a frozen hand found in a glacier in Alaska. And it was supposedly the victim of a plane crash from 1948. It was found in about 1998. This became the first forensic case I was ever involved in. There were 30 victims on that plane and we identified the person as victim number 30. We had ruled out 29 until we actually figured out who it was. This is a very famous case and it's, you could read about it pretty much, this was in hundreds of newspapers when we finally identified that who owned that hand in the snow. Uh, when that was over, I asked the Armed Forces Lab, I said, this is very interesting, what else do you have in store? And they said, well, we're working on identifying the unknown child in the Titanic. Would you like to participate in that? Well, I thought about it for about a microsecond and I said, yes. And I helped, I, this, the child was found floating in the North Atlantic after the Titanic sank. And he was buried in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He was, uh, some of the family, some of the family, Titanic families thought they knew who he was. So he was exhumed in uh, about the late nineties. And it took about 10 years to identify him. That again, he was Sidney Leslie Goodwin. I have a blog article on that. It's a compelling story. It had so many twists and turns, but he was identified as an English baby and, and um, very interesting. That's everywhere on the internet as well. Uh, from there, I, uh, in, was in partic I was an independent consultant for the Amelia Earhart Project, and I didn't work on Amelia. Actually, I worked on her navigator, Fred Noonan, and following his genealogy back to the 1600s and then forward again, I was able to obtain a DNA sample from one of his extended family, a mitochondria sample. It had to be female linked. So uh, I have that sample in my freezer downstairs. So if ever they find the crash site and there's DNA that does not match Amelia, um, the solution to the Amelia Earhart mystery might be down in my freezer in my kitchen right now. And then my, my other one is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this, it started out as an attempt to, to show that he was suffering from a rare form of cancer, thyroid cancer, that would have killed him anyway. There are many, uh, there's a lot of speculation, some proof, some things that indicate that he had the cancer, but we, we can't get his DNA because he's buried under a lot of concrete. His body was tried to be stolen 17 times. So they finally gave him a permanent burial place. 
and we had to go get the artifacts that have blood on them. A lot of, there's a lot of um, assassination relics. But to confirm that, we had to go out and get a family member to, to compare those relics to, to make sure that, to authenticate the relics. And in uh, and the end of it, we, it just got too, too interesting. We had to go off, do other things. But I will tell you, every one of these stories is worth an, a, a, another webinar. But this, uh, I will tell you the end of it, is that Barack Obama might not be the first African-American Islamic president of the United States. It may have been Abraham Lincoln, believe it or not. Anyway, so I've, I've really, in the course of time, I've researched about 50 countries. Uh, and in it, part of that is a lot of Jewish research I've done for different large projects, small projects. And here are some of the major repositories I've even been, either been to or I have researched at through the internet and been in touch with. Um, I went in 2016, I went to Berlin and Warsaw to do some on-site research for the story that I'm, I'm going to talk to you about. I decided to take a vacation. I had a lot of family drama, so it was a, it's something I enjoy. And so I went off to Europe with a bunch of frequent flyer points and uh, I got some on-site experience. I got FaceTime with those archivists, so everybody knows who I am by now. The project I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, it's ch child survivors and their story. One story in particular. About mid-2000s, I became interested in this website called missingidentity.net. And it, it's run by Ava Florsheim out of Norway. And over the course of time since the 90s, she has concentrated on reuniting child survivors with their families, their relatives, or with the families who saved them. She's got so many compelling stories. And I got attracted because there was a story about a woman who was uh, placed in a home in Louisiana because she spoke French. She was from France. So I got kind of attracted to that because of course I know a lot about New Orleans genealogy, Louisiana genealogy. In about 2012, I realized that DNA could probably help survivors reunite with each other that otherwise would never have guessed they're related. I had Ava's help in, taking th in, in recruiting three women into my program, my pilot study. Um, the one on the left was the girl who got placed in Louisiana. The one in the middle was a girl who was uh, she was a baby in a train station with her mother in 1942. The mother was in distress, could not take care of the baby. The baby was crying, attracted the attention of two Christian, uh, a Christian couple passing in the station and asked if they could help. And she was in despair. She wound up giving them the baby. They had no children. They took her and they raised her without saying a word. And in the end, in the 2000s, they, they were gone, an old aunt told the story. And it, so this woman, just a baby in a train station in 1942, became uh, the second person in my program. And I will tell you, we have found out who her mother is through DNA. We located relatives still alive in Poland. I can tell you that much. And the rest is history. She's, she's got a family back now. The one I'm gonna to talk to you about is the one on the right. Barbara Wynglinski was her name during the war. She's now, her name now is Panina Gutmann and she was born in 1942 in Warsaw, Poland. She now is a great grandmother who lives in Meshar, Israel. Her chronology in the, as of the 1990s was this of what she knew. She was born in Poland in 1942. In 1950, she moved with, to Israel with her parents who were called the Himmels. But in about 1958, when she was about 16, in an argument with her father, she found out she was adopted. And these memories started coming back, of course. You know, she started thinking about that. And after her parents passed away, she was reading a story in the newspaper in Israel about the Atwak Orphanage, which is located outside of Warsaw. And she said she realized that she had probably been in the Atwak Orphanage. So she contacted the woman who had written the article. After the war, they had quite a few orphans there. She uh, contacted the woman who had a list 
of the uh, of the inmates or the orphans at this school. And she looked down the list and she saw her own name. She realized that her name was Barbara Revan Kosmarek. So this was a revelation when you're an adoptee and you find your parents, this is great. So now she had to figure out where she was from. She went to the Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw and she, they did some research for it. And they found a letter addressed that was written. It, I think it was a reference to a letter at first. Maybe they found the letter from a, a man called Francis Kos Kosmarek, I'm sorry I can't pronounce the Polish names right, but that's close enough, uh, to the Jewish Central Committee. And it had an address in, in, in Western Poland of Sierra Kow, and it was dated 1948. So what would you do? She went to Sierra Kow, and she wanted to see if the family still lived at the address. She ran into her what she found was her stepbrother. His name was Bogdan Kosmarek. The parents were dead. Five, three of the five children were still alive, including her stepbrother Bogdan. And he provided her with this picture of her with the Kosmareks from about 1948, plus a couple of other pictures. But he said, you're not our blood relative. The way you got to be with us was that you were found in a train station by a Red Cross worker. And when, when the worker found you, you introduced yourself as Barbara Rebin, two and a half year old Barbara Rebin, and you spoke perfect German. From this, she said, okay, my name must be Barbara Rebin. So I'm gonna go find the Rebin. So she's going upstream here in time. She um, did an international call for Rebens. She went to the International Tracing Service and she went to the German Red Cross because she spoke German when she was two and a half years old. And she was contacted after two years by uh, Wolfgang and Adele Rebin. And they told her quite a bit about what happened and they made a page of testimony to the Yad Vashem, plus they contributed some other personal memories. And they said, actually, you're not our blood relative either. That in the fall of 1942, there was a woman named Gertrude Spiro. She was from Berlin and she was the wife of a Jew. The Jew had already been taken away. They don't know what happened to him, but she, Mrs. Spiro was living in Warsaw and she came to talk to our mother about rescuing a Jewish baby. They, they said our father, Charlotte was also, our parents were also from Berlin. Charlotte was a Christian woman married to Max Revan, a Jew. And they had been, he had been deported on Kristallnacht from Berlin and she had followed him with the children to Warsaw. Immediately before this happened in August of 1942, he had disappeared off the streets of Warsaw and supposedly went to Treblinka. So she was not really in a good shape, but it, it, she did agree to take this child. This was in the fall of 1942. And the story that came out of the Rebens was this, that Panina's parents, whoever they were, they could not remember the name, approached a German soldier to help rescue their infant. The German soldier's sweetheart was named Sonia Spiro. She was probably a teenager. Sonia went to her mother, Gertrude, and said, can we save this baby? And Gertrude said, we are already saving too many Jews. We don't have any more room. And she went to Charlotte, who was probably an acquaintance. We don't think they knew each other, although they were, had very similar histories. And Charlotte agreed to take her in. A couple of the personal memories were that when, when the mother arrived at the apartment, she came with the baby in a white baby carriage with linens and the child had papers for Barbara Wenglinski. That's how she got her name, Barbara. Wing we don't know if that was the real name or a fake name with papers. And the mother talked to Charlotte for a while, left the baby and said, uh, after we're finished with our job in the ghetto, they were Polish Jews, they were ghetto fighters. After we're finished with our responsibilities, we will come back, keep her safe. And then they never heard from the mother again. So Wolfgang was a photographer. He loved, for, he had a camera and so he took a lot of pictures. And so again, she was provided with baby pictures she never had. 
Here's Wolfgang with her in Warsaw, about 1943. That fountain behind them survived. It's still there. And here is, uh, they're in the park called Krolevska Park. I've been there. I've stood on that corner. Um, and this is shortly after she was rescued because you see the white baby carriage down in the left-hand corner. And you see someone standing by the baby carriage. That's Adele le leaning over the carriage, taking care of Panina. And that's Charlotte holding her um, in the park. So the chronology that she was presented with wasn't actually really complete. If you want to add the missing elements, she was born in Poland. That is correct. But first, she went to Charlotte in 1942. She was separated from them in 1944 because there was a selection and they were all brought to the train station. Charlotte and Adele went to a work camp and Wolfgang went to Mauthausen. The baby was left in the train station by herself and she was rescued by a Red Cross worker who brought her to the Kosmarig family, a Christian family in Sierra Cow. Um, they already had five children, but they took her in and by the way, they've been named Righteous Before the Nations for doing that. So in 1948, after, um, after the war, they wanted to adopt her. She was, what, six years old now. So she went to the Jewish Central Committee. They went to the Jewish Central Committee to ask to get that arranged. And the committee, instead of, they had to find out if her parents survived. They couldn't adopt her if her parents were still alive. The Jewish Central Committee, however, uh, went, sent a representative to the house and took her away because they put her in an orphanage because the, the mandate was to preserve the Jewish nation. There were many stories, you can read about this on Missing Identity and many other websites, that many children that had been put in families that rescued them were taken back and put in orphanages, a place with Jewish Jewish families so they could be raised Jewish to preserve the nation. And she was one of those children that was put in the Otwok orphanage. But at 1948, and about 19, a little bit later, the Himmels came and adopted her and finally brought her to Israel in 1950. So it, she had quite an, she changed hands four times to be saved. Any one of these, if it had been a disconnect, she would have perished, but she survived. Here's pictures that she never had any baby pictures. That was one of the things, the epiphany she had when she had that fight with her father. She didn't have any baby pictures. So here's what Wolfgang gave. That's another one, you've seen that. Here's a few others as a, as a tiny baby. That's, she's being held by Adele there in the, little, in the little suit she had. This is a picture the Cosmarics took after they came to her. Here's another one, here's another one. Uh, here's a picture of her in Israel as a young woman. Here's uh, maybe 10 years ago with, she has two beautiful daughters. She has grandchildren. She has great grandchildren now. That's a success story. And here is the ceremony where Charlotte was named righteous before the nations in the 1990s when the, when the Rebbins were reunited with their little sister they called Basha. The woman who arranged all this was Gertrude Spiro. So in thinking this through and hearing this story, I realized the next step was to find out what happened to Gertrude Spiro. If she, and we learned that, you see the spelling's different, that is the correct spelling now. The Rebbins never saw the name written, so they wouldn't know, but this is what we found, S-P-I-R-O. Um, in the next step, if Gertrude survived, she would certainly be gone. But her, she had a daughter, Sonia, and Sonia may have been, if she survived, she would have been, you know, 90. That's possible. So I said, let's, let's find out what happened to Gertrude and Sonia. Even if they died in the meantime, maybe their children have papers or stories. So, okay, the next step was to figure out who Gertrude Spiro was. Here is a picture taken by Wolfgang, maybe even the day that Gertrude came over to talk to her about the baby. Um, I've looked at this picture for hours and I, I only wish they could just jump out the picture and talk to me and tell me what happened. We, it doesn't really work that way, does it? 
but they have uniforms on. Gertrude's wearing like a W on her pocket. And so I've spent a lot of time researching that uniform with not too much, you know, success. It was probably just something she wore at, wore at work. Not so much like she's not in the army, she's not in some organization. She just, it's a uniform she wore. In going through the <clears throat> telephone directories and the city directories for Warsaw at that time, they have, they have both the uh, Warsaw directories and the general gouvernement. That was the central government that uh, the Nazis set up in central Poland. Uh, the 1941 General Gouvernement telephone book actually lists Gertrude Spiro. She owned a liquor and cigarette shop in Warsaw. At first, you have to really think about this because in, in wartime, the two most expensive commodities are liquor and cigarettes. This woman had probably a lot of inventory. She had a lot of bargaining power. You have to think about that. Um, at the beginning of the ghetto, say about 1942, the beginning of that, a cigarette, a pack of cigarettes cost 30 cents in the local currency. But during the Warsaw ghetto uprising, one cigarette cost $250. She had a lot of bargaining power. If you look at the, this is a map of the ghetto <clears throat> at the time uh, it was forming. This was one of the early maps. And I'll call your attention to the corner, the, the northeast corner. The northeast corner, actually, it was a, a Jewish quarter that was originally incorporated into the ghetto, and the Jews were forced out. But after that, the, the boundaries were retracted, and that area became part of the Aryan side. Gertrude's shop was right there on the corner. How she got that location, I don't know. I, I have tried to pursue the property records in Warsaw <clears throat> without too much help. She probably rented the shop. Somebody else probably owned the building. Um, and furthermore, it was right by the gate to the ghetto, and it was right where the sewers came up from the, you know, ghetto. And you know, by if you know history at all, the sewers were the superhighway into and out of the ghetto. She was really well positioned for smuggling. So not only did she have cigarettes and alcohol, she was in the right place at the right time. I looked at, is it the Ringelbaum archives? Uh, and I, I read Barbara Enkel King's book, Guide to the Paris City. And in there, uh, they describe smuggling. And one of the stories they tell is there was a phone number that the smugglers called at a certain time every day. And they'd answer the phone. <clears throat> it was a cafe. And the person at the other end would tell them what gate was most likely open that day, the best gate for smuggling on that day. And I traced that phone number through the, the phone directories I told you about, and it was right next to Gertrude's shop. So she was the right place for smuggling lots of things, including a baby. We, we traced Gertrude, and one thing we found, thanks to the Jewish Historical Institute, was her arrest record. Her daughter and Sonia and Gertrude were arrested in 1943, about six months after they uh, saved Panina. And in this record, it was very interesting because this was supplied by the Jewish Historical Institute and, and explained Paviak prison was a, a prison in Warsaw that was mainly for political prisoners. It was for prisoners that were partisans, they were um, you know, resistance people, and they were generally just picked up off the street in Warsaw. There were some Jews in this prison, but I, the majority were not. The Jews were sent somewhere else. Gertrude and Sonia evidently got in trouble and they were picked up. And what's interesting about this record is that it, first of all, it names them as priest Spiro, not just Spiro. Later, much later, I came to realize that Gertrude had divorced her Jewish husband in Berlin. He was probably, you know, he was gone into the prison system. So for whatever reason, she divorced him and went back to using her maiden name, priest. This gave us her maiden name, in fact, and allowed a lot more research on her history. But to keep the mother and the daughter together, they kept both names, Priest Spiro, in the records. 
Here's Gertrude and her daughter. It gives Gertrude's parents' name as Frederick and Maria. We know they're from Berlin. That allowed us to research Gertrude's um, history back to Kaliningrad when she was born in the 1890s. Um, and then, of course, Spy Spyro, Sonia Spyro, her mother was Gertrude. Now we find out her father was Leo or Leon, and that allowed us to also enhance our research for Gertrude. Here's a picture of Paviak Prison. It has been destroyed. It was destroyed right at the end of the war. There's a memorial there now. I have been to Paviak and I have gone through the records and archives. I could give you another talk just on Gertrude. She's very interesting. But I'll tell you, here's another picture. Paviak was known for its just, uh, you know, gruesome, uh, just all the gruesome stuff that happened. And this was a particular event where they just took a bunch of people and hung them. You could be shot for looking the wrong way or crossing the street at the wrong time. You know, little old ladies were hung. Uh, it was more than I can, I can even understand but to understand the, the environment. And so now that, that Gertrude and Sonia in Paviak, I was thinking, what happened to them? The answer is this, they were on a transport from Paviak to Auschwitz in August of 1943, about a year after Panina was rescued. Here is their record. They were uh, two of 142 women who were deported to Auschwitz on that day. Um, it, it, coincidentally, just to mention, if you're familiar with the writer Christina Zawolska, she was a very famous Polish writer about the um, Holocaust. She was also on the same uh, transport. She wrote a book, I Survived Auschwitz, and she also wrote another book, Empty Water, and I recommend them both. She survived, she was on the transport. So now the question is, did Gertrude and Sonia survive the transport, survive Auschwitz? Well. The way you find out <clears throat> is you go to the website, Auschwitz-Birkenau website. They have a database of, of people that were there. It's not complete. As you know, during the end of the war, when the camp was liberated, the Nazis burned a lot of the records. But there still are some there. And of course, they're trying to always find more. You can go and you can look up a, a name. You will get the prisoner number and you'll get a little bit of history about whether the person survived, when they arrived, um, when, if they survived. You know, for example, this woman, Stephania Dudek, she wound up being sent to Ravensbrück, which was mostly a woman's camp. But in the end, she survived and she was liberated. So quite likely she'd have a page of testimony or she'd have descendants that might be able to tell you more. Okay, you know what I did, I typed in all the names and numbers, I figured out that transport, the number of people, there were 142, right? So I made a list of 142 names and their numbers in the camp. When I got to Spyro, that number was empty. There, there wasn't any, neither Gertrude nor Sonia was there. And you'd expect Sonia to be there because her name was Sonia Spyro. Gertrude's name was now her maiden name, Gertrude Priest. There were 142 people on the departure list and there were 141 Auschwitz arrivals. There was no record of anyone dying on the transport, by the way. They had 142 slots available and only 141 names showed up. One name is empty under Spyro and no one named Priest is on the list. So if you look through those names and you add and subtract you know, you figure out who's who, you will find Gertrude and Sonia were not on the list of arrivals. And I have no idea, I have never been able to find out what happened. I, they were just, they didn't arrive. They were not there at Auschwitz to arrive. They were on the departure list and I gather that list was made ahead of time. There were probably 10 lists. You know, people listed a couple of times and then, you know, selected to be on the transport. There was probably another list of people getting on the transport. There was probably another list of people arriving. And there was probably another list of people standing in line and getting their tattoos with their numbers. And somehow between the original list and the people just being assigned their number, these women disappear and the rest is history. I have looked through every 
telephone directory in, in uh, Germany and Poland, and there's nowhere to be found. I have no idea what happened to these women. She could have bought her way off. Remember, she's got cigarettes, she's got alcohol, she probably has money, she probably has some political connections because of her location and all of her people wanting that. Uh, that I just don't know what happened to them. So that was a dead end. She was born 24th, February, 1899 in Kaliningrad, and who knows what happened. Back on track. So Gertrude turned out not to be the answer. Here's the chronology, born in Poland. Her parents went to the German soldier and she wound up in Charlotte's apartment under her care. They were separated during selection a couple of years later. She was found by a Red Cross worker in a train station and taken to the Kosmaric family who kept her during the war. They were forced to give her up to the orphanage in Otwok from whence the Himmels adopted her and the family moved to Israel when she was eight years old. So there you go. So where do you go with that? What, what do you, how do you advance? Well, there's one thing that I haven't told you yet, and that is that when her mother was at the apartment and gave her up with the baby carriage and the false papers, she told Wolfgang and Adele something. She said, if we don't come back for her, send her to our relatives in America. This was in the fall of 1942. It was sent, said by an anonymous woman bringing in with a baby, being told to two people who are repeating the story 70 years later. So you think, okay, relatives in America, Panina probably has somebody here. How do you find, America is a, a huge place, right? How do you find her relatives in America? Well, you can find them, and it's, you use something called DNA. Panina originally, going back to the first slide, uh, you know, we signed her up for a, a DNA study from 23andMe. We had her tested with all the other services, and when she tested at Ancestry, shortly after she tested with Ancestry, she came up with a first to second cousin. It says second cousin on the little flag, but it's a first to second cousin. And you know, it's, it's a very high match. And so we said, let's contact this woman, Miss First, whoever she is, and uh, see if she knows anything. Okay, so that's what we did. Here's Helen, Helen Carp First. She's gonna be 89 this year. She lives in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. She is trained in, in, in her 60s. She went back to get a, I think a PhD in psychology because she wanted to do, do social work. And she, through a lot of analysis and thought, she is Panina's first, first cousin once removed. So she's some kind of first cousin, which is interesting. Here's, if you can remember what a first cousin once removed is. Here's Helen. Helen's mother, which she knows her mother was Frieda Bernstein. I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce the Polish names really correctly, but that's close. Uh, her grandparents were Isaac Bernstein and Adele Berlinstein. Coming down uh, the other side, Frieda had quite a few sisters. She had at least five. And then they had Panina's mother or father, one of those sisters had a child, which could be Panina's father, mother or father, and there's Panina. So in other words, Helen is a first cousin of Panina's, one of Panina's parents. And the first cousin once removed is the child of a first cousin. How do you know if it's mom or dad? That's a critical question when you do this research. Who are you looking for? Who's, what's the gender? There's a way you can do this. And if it's called mitochondrial DNA. So mitochondria, as you may know, is passed along the direct female line of the family. So here we have Helen going to her mother, going to Adele, going to one of the sisters, going to somebody, and then going to Panina. If that somebody is a woman, then you can say it's the mother. If it doesn't match, so if it's yes, that means the connection is through Panina's mother. If it doesn't match, it's got to be the father. We did the mitochondria between Helen and Panina, and it doesn't match. So therefore, the connection is Panina's father. So one of those sisters 
is the paternal grandmother, her paternal grandmother, if you follow that. Here is finally, finally, Panina came to the United States last year. She's been here a couple of times before. And she and Helen, it, the, I really love the picture. They, they had never met. Helen grew up with her father's family. They had, you know, so many of them had gone, already left Poland before the war. Her mother had come to the United States in 1930. Helen was born in 31. And she left her whole family behind and, you know, went from agency to agency throughout the war, trying to find out what happened and nothing ever came back out. So Helen, her mother lived a life never knowing and this affected Helen. Pina, of course, had no relatives. She didn't know who she was. And this was the first relative, close relative she had ever met. And here is, you know, just about the first morning that they had ever met. And this was at sponsored, the meeting and the, you know, the event, you know, it was just us. There was only a half a dozen, myself, the archivist, these two, uh, Panina's husband was there, a couple of other uh, people from the museum. And they kind of stayed with us today and gave us a tour. And, and this was history. The good thing about Helen is she inherited a lot of pictures from her mother. And the Holocaust Museum sent a representative up to Helen's apartment in New York to curate the pictures, to take them, to copy them, to, to uh, identify them and make a Helen first collection at the museum. A lot of these pictures, some of them we've identified, some we haven't, but we're working on it. And the best picture of all is this picture haunts me. I have sat and watched, just like the picture of Gertrude, I have watched, looked at this picture for hours, just hoping against hope one of those women would step out the picture and tell me who she is. We've ruled out, the, the one on the right was Rebecca, and we have ruled her out because Rebecca may have been the product of an earlier marriage. Um, we think she was. Rebecca left for the UK when she probably 1920s. Uh, and then from there, she went to the United States much later in life. She died in New Jersey. She did not have any children. She cannot be the, the, the grandmother. We know that <clears throat> this is Frida. She can't be the grandmother. So one of the other three women in the picture, it could be another one that we don't, it's not in the picture we don't know about, but most likely one of these three women is Panina's grandmother. This is so frustrating, even having a picture of the grandmother and still not knowing who she is. So what do you do? Which Bernstein sister is the right one? Because the right one is gonna be her grandmother. Who did this woman marry? Because the connection is through the son, and therefore, if we could find out who she married, we give we have Panina's family name. Here's some possible names from the photographs. We had Weintal, we had Eisenberg, Asherson, and Sherman. We have ruled out two of them because Weintal was they weren't in the right place at the right time. The, one of the sisters married a Weintal and he had to go because he was a doctor. He was sent to Scotland for some other and he couldn't get back to Poland. So that could not be Panina's father. Uh, Eisenberg, um, we have ruled that out. We got a distant cousin tested and it was a distant cousin. It was part of Helen's picture collection. We identified an Eisenberg cousin, but it turned out it was not a sister or brother. It, it was a cousin, but not immediate. So we left with Asherson and Sherman. I have to tell you, my rest of my talk is going to be one, I'm going to tell you a close call we had, and I will tell you about another something that happened recently. Uh, I'm going to interject just for a moment to ask that um, we do leave time for questions because we end at one o'clock. So I just want to make sure that there's some time because I'm sure there will be plenty. Okay, I'm hurrying. Uh, Joseph Sherman, uh, this was an arrest record that the U.S. Holocaust Museum found uh, for us. He was born in 1910 in Warsaw. He was the son of Mosek Sherman and Siva Bernstein. You see the names coming up. His, his wife was River. Rivka Weinberg, and he was arrested in 1942 in Lublin for not wearing his Jewish armband. I'll go a little bit fast. 
you see you notice the names, right? So this becomes very interesting to us. We found another newspaper article that described a domestic dispute between the couple, and it gave the address at Wilsa 57 for the Sherman family. So we said, is this our family? And it turns out this is, in the Polish paper, there was an obit published for Branla Bernstein, who was Helen's great aunt. We know this is part of Helen's family. And there the Shermans from Wilsa are recognized, are, are, are the ones that gave this obit. So here's the Weinberg, we trace the Weinberg family. Here's the pages of testimony that say that the, the, the Weinberg family was like this. Emanuel Weinberg and Hava Rosenberg had eight children. The two surviving children were Adele and Israel, and Adele has a daughter that lives in Israel right now. So what did we do? That was Rivka, was a sister. She was married to Joseph Sherman, who was arrested in that record. Did they have a daughter named Panina Gutman? Are they first cousins? So we had Leah take an ancestry test. Of course, that's what we did. Guess what? No match. If you look at the genealogy, all we can say is that that side, the, the Weinbergs are not related, but we can't say anything about the Shermans. Joseph could have had a daughter by another wife, or maybe it was his brother, because that, maybe that is the, we know that's a family, but you know, it could be another connection and not Joseph, you get the same parents. So we're looking for Shermans now to test that were part of that family. In the meantime, this is the last thing, we, this is what we're doing now. We came across a new match on ancestry. It's a third or fourth cousin. We look at all the cousins, right? But this one was interesting because, um, you know, because it's a third or fourth cousin, it's a very remote connection. It could be great greats or great great greats. We don't, it, it's a very uh, distant connection. This is the family tree we constructed for this young man, JW. Here's his parents, here's his grandparents, here's his greats, here's his great greats. And when we came across the great greats, we're building all these trees out, coming to the, we do everything we can to try and figure out how, what the connection is, because he is connected. He is, he shares DNA, he is a relative. So well, let's look at these people. You have um, Beric, um, Abraham Nedwar, and, and they had, that's the great, great, greats. They had four children. One of them, the daughter, Giddle, the, the, the son, Morris, came to the United States and the parents followed. They had three daughters left in Poland. One of them married Haim Yarmos, and they had seven children. They had three daughters, two sons, and a daughter, Chevy Leah Yarmos and Moshe Yarmos. They had seven children. The interesting part is Chevy Leah married a man named Isaac Wenglinski. You notice, you recognize that name. And they had four children. So now the question comes up, are they related? Did we find the Wenglinski family? So we had, we are now having, if we ever get this done, I've had trouble getting a kit, a DNA kit to Israel. I think we solved the problem yesterday. Sharon can tell you that, she helped out. The question is, is this, could this possibly be Panina's sister? You know, and if it's not, if the Wenglinski name was borrowed, say Isaac had a cousin or a relative, um, we already know there's a connection because of JW, right? And the question is how close? And is this a Wenglinski family we've been looking for since 2012? So stay tuned for further developments. I'll let everybody know how that works out. I hate to leave you hanging there, but that's where we are right now. We're hanging. And I'm going to say thank you to everyone, including Sharon Levy, who, who is between Canada and Israel. And I will leave you with that picture I love so much. So you can, you can hope that the women jump out and tell me what the answer is. And that's it. Thank you so much for having me. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. I'm actually going to stop the sharing so I can see people's faces.